Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, it's great to be here. See some old friends. I haven't seen them for a while. Um, and so, yeah, so what I want to do is really briefly touch on some of our work um, using sat satellite tags to get at the movements of some large collages. Um, and um, I'm going to jump right in. One of the first things I wanted to do was to, for those of you who, um, who understand something about why we care about sharks, this is actually a picture I took in the Dubai fish market. Um, all those sharks were brought in early in the morning by about by evening. They're cutting up all the fins, auctioning them off, and they're dumping them off. So this is going on um, at a truly industrial scale around the world. Uh, you know, I think it's it's sort of moot to argue whether it's 50 million or 100 million sharks that are killed every year. Either way you slice it, it's way in the, you know it's way more than could ever be justified in any kind of sustainable harvest. So there is a there is a real problem in it, and I don't think we should get so bogged down in the details of exactly how many it is. It's way too many, but it's certainly not sustainable. And so that is the impetus for a lot of our work trying to understand some of the biology and particularly movements of these individuals, because in any kind of um, conservation and sustainable management scheme, you have to know where the sharks are susceptible to capture, and that is one thing that we haven't had a lot of success with. But what I want to do is just to give you guys, especially if you guys were on the boat, you probably didn't have a chance to actually jump in the water um, necessarily and see what it's like. So I'm going to take you first to the, to the Azores, where it's a very similar kind of water masses, and it gives you some idea for that environment once you get under the water. Um, and I think that you'll agree, the same kind of things are going on with the so there, that it really is incredibly beautiful. These are big sperm, a sperm whale and a calf. Uh, these are some of the seamounts. Uh, these guys get close enough to the surface so we can actually dive on them. Um, and this guy is a blue shark, very ubiquitous all through the North Atlantic. Plenty of blue sharks caught in the Sargasso Sea as well. So really, uh, really amazing ecosystems, uh, beautiful, and uh, I think um, really, uh, I think we, get to, we know incredibly little about what happens in the ocean. We know a good amount. Uh, we know, I think, a reasonable amount on coral reefs, for instance. We can jump on the water with scuba since the 50s. Um, once you get out in the open ocean, I think it's the more you look into it, the more you realize just how little we actually know. And this again is just to give you some idea of what it's like down there. These are Chilean devil rays off the Azores, and one of the animals that we've been tagged, and I'll show, I'll show you some data in a little bit. But um, I think uh, you know, if you're trying to sell the ocean, it's these guys do a great job, right? You know, I mean, they really are incredible. And they are, I don't know, it's, uh, maybe it's just me, but if you, if you look these guys in the eye, gee, they look smart. <laughs> we'll get to that in a little bit. So it's a devil ray, the um, genus Mobula, really um, amazing animals, and um, it's interesting, we're learning a lot about devil rays, and, and, and mantas as well, and mantas actually are remarkably um, resident in a lot of locations. These guys, devil rays, as you'll see, these guys are really ocean nomads. Um, so this is um, Mobula terrapicana, and you can see one of our sat tags just behind the, the um, right-hand um, wing. So it's, it's very small compared to the animal itself. I don't think it's doing anything to them. And these are some of the first data that we got, going back to that idea that these guys are nomads. So these guys are all tagged um, in the top um, panel of those, in the top part of those, of those maps. And then in anything from three to six months, they're traveling at least 3,000 kilometers. And they're traveling through water that's very much like this, I guess. So very nutrient poor, very clear. Um, in some sense, you know, we I think traditionally would have called those waters deserts, right? But I think that's actually far from the case. Um, and I think it just shows you how little we understand about these environments. So one question becomes, well, so how are they doing it? How are they managing to travel through that environment? Are they feeding along the way or are they simply simply traveling, you know, doing the humpback whale thing and not feeding while they're making that kind of migration? Um, and this is actually one of the one of those really you know great times to be a scientist, right? Because you get data back that you never expected. And so these are some some um, dive data from these mobile terrapicanus. And just in case you can't read it on the y-axis, that's 2,000 meters at the bottom. So that's two kilometers. So what we thought were these sort of um, tropical surface rays turned out to be anything but. Um, that the color is water temperature on those deep dives, these rays are down at three or four degrees Celsius. So they are in, they're moving into very cold water, um, they're doing it by diving, you know, very, very deeply. Um, 
And I think, yeah, we will, I think the, well, it's one of those things, you know, the first tag comes back and you go, ah, oh, the tag malfunction, right? There's no way that these guys can be going 50,000 meters and then you get more and more tags back and you realize that, yeah, they, that they really are. And so what I'm going to do is just take, quickly take you through one of those dive profiles because that turned out to be pretty interesting too. So I'm going to speed up the profile, um, but we're going to start in surface waters. And I think that's a, every uh, 75 seconds is one of those dots. So they're on the surface and then they decide to dive. And when they dive, they dive really quickly. So that is, 75, that, that is 400 meters in about 75 seconds. So that's about 12 to 13 knots. But these guys, uh, they're, not, they're not sinking. These guys are swimming as hard as they can straight down um, to do it. And so that was an interesting question too. But anyway, really rapid dives when they decide to go. And there it goes, it keeps on going down, it gets to find something, it levels out, keeps on going down again. Then it hits the bottom, the deepest part of the dive, and then it comes back up again. And you can see it sort of stepping its way back up, coming up a little bit, leveling off for a while, coming up a little bit, leveling off for a while, until it gets all the way back up to the surface. Um, so they're diving really deeply at the initial phase of the dive, they're doing it quickly, they're very actively swimming down about as hard as they can. And so the question becomes, um, relevant to that question, of how, are, how are they in ocean nomads? You know, what are they doing down there? Um, and and when we've thought about it a lot, we don't know what they're doing down there because we haven't been down, down there with them yet. Um, but I think it's, it's really hard to think they're doing anything else but feeding. Uh, it really doesn't seem to be any other reason for them to be down there. This is just to show that that profile is not an anomaly. All, almost all the profiles look that same kind of pattern bombing down and then coming up and stepping their way back. Um, and so the, so the obvious question is what are they doing? And we think it's feeding. And um, we think that they're actually not, they're not plankivores in the true sense. They're not like mantis simply swimming with their mouths open. These guys, their mouths are subterminal. And so we actually think that they're actually actively going out with fish. And we get some idea from that, again, from the Azores. These are mesopelagic fishes that should be, that you can tell by the light, there's a lot of light. These guys should be at about 1,000 meters during the day. Sometime in the ocean they get stuck, um, whether it's predators, where they actually get caught up in the surface. And they become very easy prey for big pelagics. And you realize why they make that migration down. But we hadn't seen this before. But this is going to give you some idea. This is a mobile And it's going to actually you know, attack that bait ball. And so you can imagine what we imagine happening down at 1,000 meters is these rays are bombing down they are actually encountering a very thin layer of mesopelagic fishes. They form these very dense um, but narrow layers, hitting a layer, stopping, you know, leveling off, swimming through that layer for a while before deciding before coming out of that layer and then going um, deeper again or, or stepping its way back up. So um, this is the kind of hunting that we think um, these mobilers are doing down at depth. And so you can imagine that you can look at a depth sounder, for instance, if you can get it that to go that far down in the water column. These mesopelagic fishes in the day form these very dense, thin layers. Um, and you can imagine that that's probably the target for these rays and why they're doing that, that deep, those deep diving. But again, the, the surface waters you might, you might classify as a desert during the day, but there is a ton of biomass, there's a ton of um, animals in those waters that are extremely important. Not only for mobilers, but for a big eye tuna, we'll get to it, for swordfish. In fact, for just about every, anything that we put a tag on that goes into the Sargasso dives deep. This seems to be the way it is. <coughs> okay, and so um, switch over to white sharks. And I think that, um, that this was a bit of a surprise to you, right? This is a white shark. This is actually not in the North Atlantic, but um, why we wild this very big really water to get good pictures of white sharks. And so before we really started this work, this is what we knew about white shark distributions in the North Atlantic. And these are all um, verified records of white sharks. And as you can see, I don't know if I would be if I were you, I would say from that graph that white sharks are very coastal um, species. Um, and, and, um, but again, it turns out that's simply because that's where we see them. So we, um, with our, um, in fact, the main person doing this work is Greg Scommel here in the, in the state of Massachusetts. And he's been doing um, a lot of electronic tagging of white sharks. Um, we can get to them reasonably regularly now off, off Monomoy Island at the end of Chatham. Um, so we had access to these sharks during the summer and um, have now got a relatively um, extensive and intensive sampling program for these white sharks. 
And so they've actually become relatively famous. If you get on the internet. Um, this is Curly. She was a, a discovery <laughs> um, And so this was the, this is what our first indication. This was a satellite tag, a high satellite tag put on Curly. Um, and so she was tagged off Chan, and this is what she did. And this really was our first indication that the white sharks are doing something a little bit different than simply hugging the coast, as you might think, based on that. And, um, and the other interesting thing, as I was sort of alluded to, is that they, they dive deep as well. But they're in the Sargasso, these white sharks are going down to 800 meters um, as well. And you can imagine they're not going down there for kicks, that they're actually, that's actually where they get their food. Um, and so that, you know, that, again, is a really common theme. Um, so Lydia um, is an interesting shark as well, another white shark. That was, she was tagged off Florida, but Florida, but we actually had two kinds of tags on, on Lydia. A spot tag giving us position, and then a standard satellite tag giving, giving us all the depth information. And for the first time, we were really able to recover the three-dimensional movements of one of these sharks. And it turned out to be really interesting because she's doing very different things in different water masses um, as she's swimming along. So on your right-hand side is actually a panel showing water temperature throughout the six-month record of her movements. And on the right, on, on your left, you've actually got the track that she did. You can see she's in a warm core already there. She's in a cold core already. She's at the edge of the Gulf Stream on the next one. So all this information is actually recorded in these tags and giving us a really interesting idea of the sort of lifetime movements in a three-dimensional way for these white sharks, which is something that we haven't seen before. And we're working actually with a colleague doing a much more intensive analysis of this data. And it turns out that she, that Lydia, is very in tune with ocean eddies. Um, and she's doing very different things in cold core eddies versus warm core eddies. But I think it just goes to show how well these animals no, sense the environment in ways that, that we, to this day, can't do ourselves. This is some of her dive profiles, again, about 800 meters. Um, and, and so Lydia is <coughs> the internet sensation, right? Because she's just, she's just gone everywhere. Right? I think she's up to about 20,000 kilometers. Away. And so she's gone all through the Saga, so she's actually crossed into the eastern Atlantic. Um, she really is an ocean wanderer. Um, but I think the important thing for the Sargasso is that what we see is that at some point in time, even if the animals are not spending, necessarily spending a lot of time in the Sargasso Sea, they're all going through the Sargasso Sea at some time. And so I think that that really is the important message to take home. Not so much necessarily that there's these huge resident populations, but it's part of this highway that big eye tuna, that white shark, that, that mobile is. They, that swords all go through. Okay, really quickly, because the swords are actually very important in the Sargasso. Um, and again, using some satellite data, we're, we're getting this kind of information um, of how swords move. Um, swords actually don't tend to move east-west a lot. They pretty much move north and south from the Caribbean up to the Grand Banks. But again, they're going through the Sargasso. And um, this is what swords look like in terms of their diving behavior. They really are the champion of deep diving behavior. So, these guys, the, um, every, every night, every night uh, about 6 o'clock in the evening, they're coming up to the surface. They're following those mesopelagic fishes. Sun rise, they dive, and they just keep on going to about 800 meters, and they'll stay there all day um, at 800 meters before the next sunset, and these, the swords are following the, um, the, their prey, the, the mesopelagic fishes and squid, back up into the surface water. So again, these guys are really tied into that mesopelagic biomass um, in a way, uh, and, and given how little we know about those mesopelagic fishes and squids, uh, it's a huge knowledge gap um, that the Sargasso Sea actually is a really nice sort of manageable micro meso, you know, it's a big mesocosm, but of, of what's happening in those ocean ecosystems. And from a science facility perspective, I think that's one of the most important things that the Sargasso can do. And places, places like Bermuda are one of the few places that you can have access to that fauna, that ecosystem, almost right off the top. You know, the Azores is another place, but there are very few places like that which have really good scientific infrastructure so close to the abyssal plain where you get these kinds of things. So what that means is that um, these animals are all diving, but they're all doing it in slightly different ways. And so that our mobilers are the champion deep divers in this group, so they dive very deeply, but they dive for maybe 60 to 90 minutes, occasionally longer, but not much longer. 
We have the white sharks diving maybe three or four hours to about five, six hundred, eight hundred meters. And then of course we have the swords who do something a little bit different, right? Bit quite deep dives, but for very long periods of time. And so just really quick, I just want to finish up. There's a really interesting paper that I know Amy's got um, that came out recently, which suggested that, which just goes to show how little we know about that means like magic fish water. And so what they did using several different methods figured out that we had actually underestimated the total biomass of mesopelagic fishes in the world's oceans conservatively by a factor of 10 and probably more likely considerably more than that. So we had this incredible storage of carbon. If you're interested in nothing else but climate change, you've got a ton of carbon in these fishes that we, that we don't understand. In fact, if you put that biomass into, into current um, global climate models or, or models of carbon flux, the models simply blow up. So we're clearly missing something really fundamental in terms of, in terms of the, uh, the role that these ocean ecosystems play and, and even something as fundamental as carbon transport. They're really important. There is a ton of biomass and we know virtually nothing about it. So if anyone's looking for a really good topic to go and study, that would be a good one. Okay. <laughs> Um, and to get back to my final slide, you know, I think we've, we've, uh, we're at a really interesting point. I, mean, I think I say this every time I come here, but in terms of in terms of the oceans and ocean conservation, and um, you know, I think uh, you know, I say this. I know people more uh, importantly than me say it too. The next ten years are probably the most important decade of the oceans in the next two hundred years. We're we're at a point where we still have a reasonably wild ocean in some places. We still have large predators that we simply have lost from almost all terrestrial systems. It's not too late, but gee, it's getting really close to being too late. So I think for anyone going out now, there is some really, it's a really great time to be, in, to be interested in ocean science and ocean conservation because the next 10 years are gonna make a huge difference in terms of what our children and our grandchildren are going to be able to see in the oceans. It's really our last shot at maintaining the wild ocean. So it's really important to get involved um, now because it's now it's never going to be a better time. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer questions if there's time. But thanks for your attention. Striking feature of those dive profiles, except for the shark, that you know they stop at a at a depth and then they go down some more kind of random steps. I can believe that it's a layer of fish and they go forth. Yep. But the upward steps at the bottom of the dive are awfully regular. Could that be their decompression program rather than food? Um, or don't they need to do that? So they don't need to do yeah, no. so they, they don't. Um, yeah. so, what I th I, so what I think, if, uh, what I think they're doing actually is, um, what I did tell about these rays is that one of the really interesting things is in the 1970s, they did like dissection, right? and they found that these rays had red horopoly, so which are basically these count current heat exchange systems. And at that point, they, they were like, well, we must, what are, you know, what are these for, right? In fact, they suggested that they were air conditioning, not heating, right? That the plumbing was the other way. Um, and so, you know, we published this paper and it was amazing how many people got back to me the next day saying, you know, yeah, exactly. So you look at those deep dives and you think, no wonder they need to stay warm. They're down in three or four degrees Celsius water for a long time. So what I think they're doing is they're actually swimming so fast to warm up. They're generating a lot of heat in those big pectoral wings. They use that and, then, and then they're saving that heat as best as they can. But they, you know, their, their systems are not as good as storage, so they do lose heat. Um, and I think that's why that, that's what they're doing coming back up to the top. I think they get they get cold. They come back up a little bit. They can stay at that depth for a little longer, but then they get cold again. So they, that's my interpretation of the step back up. But yeah, it was, it was really interesting. It was great to be able to you know to show why they had this yeah. this kind of current heat exchange system. Yeah. So I'm very, like, very glad to hear your uh, point at the end about you've got 10 years to do something. And that was a point I brought up in the discussion about what the we should do with the CEC. We could have a long debate about should we save the future for mining or other things. But the urgency is now. And that, I, I, my point was, well, let's just make a temporary decision. Let's say 
Nothing happens in our EDC for 10 years because we know the biology can recover in that time frame. And if we fail to do that, the risk of losing that biology keeps going up. And so while we want to have a good long-term solution for management of the Sargasso Sea, we can't debate it and lose the charismatic metaquam and all the value that it provides in, in regulating all the process of the ocean. So the 10 year is a kind of a simple chunk of time, but at a biological level, very significant for successful reproduction and, 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 and gathering more data about what's happening. Yeah, you know, so I'm a scientist, right? But I am very aware of the argument that the scientists make that we need more science before we make, <coughs> make a decision. And um, we absolutely need more science. But to my mind, that doesn't mean that we can't make decisions now and then, you know, monitor what happens, the effects of those. So I, I'm really one of those people that, you know, um, we, we, there's a lot we don't know, but there is no reason why we shouldn't be making decisions now based on what we do know, right? And, and, and to not lock yourself into a forever, yeah. you know, take some forever, that's a scary proposition to really yeah. turn yeah. people yeah. away from that idea, but you give them a halfway from the report, like, well, let's just take 10 years and, and look and see and learn, and then make the grand decision. But you know, that's a great point because you're right, the, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's a marine protected area on a coral reef or I think in like Bermuda, in, in five years I think you would see enough to have those people become supporters. And you know, just uh, there's a very old, relatively old reserve in, in New Zealand um, at Lee at Goat Island. And the biggest supporters of that are the lobster fishermen who fish the edge, you know, because they, they understand what even a tiny reserve has done. In that, in that part of the world. So yeah, I agree, get them, get them closed, let the fishermen see the effects of that closure, and then they become the, the, the best advocates you could ever have, right? Yeah. So um, it seems to me that your work is very contingent on the equipment that you're using. And of course, as an engineer and a room scientist, that's what I'm interested in too. So I'm just wondering how your piece of equipment both um, stays waterproof at two kilometers below the surface and maintains a connection, or maybe not maintains, but connects with satellites um, while still underwater. Right, so um, the, the waterproofness um, is, uh, is actually, that's not too tough. Uh, we've got with that. We don't actually make those tags, but even with the ocean gravity of people who certainly could. Um, though you raise a good point in terms of the connections with satellites. And so the biggest problem that we have um, following animals in the ocean <coughs> is the air-water interface. Right? So it's, a, it's impossible to get any sort of signal through that interface. And it's the reason why nuclear sub, you know, $100 billion nuclear sub, still have to put an aerial above the, above the water to get any kind of signal from anywhere, right? So, what, so that is actually the, the one problem we have. So a lot of those tracks, if they're using standard tidal tags, they use um, what we call light level geolocation which is based on the time of sunrise and sunset and the length of day. But that can be the navigated stuff, right? I mean, and it's plus or minus, you know, best case scenario, maybe 100 kilometers, but worst case scenario, we're a lot bigger than that. So if you're, if you're tracking a bluefin from the Mediterranean to the Gulf of Mexico, then plus or minus 100 miles is not necessarily a big deal. But if you want to look at seamount residency, then it's impossible using the kind of technology. And so, one way to get around it is to put an, um, the tags on the dorsal fins, and that's what we do with the sharks. And so there's an aerial, so if the dorsal fin goes above the water, we can get a signal. And then we get a plus or minus less than a kilometer kind of accuracy, um, even better. But, um, you know, at our lab, what we're working on is actually is a new kind of tag that would actually give us positions almost as good as satellites, um, but without the need to get above the water. And that, I think, is going to really revolutionize the kind of research that we can do because now we can track individuals at 800 meters for months at a time and have positions every day that are going to be accurate enough to look at those kinds of things. So it's a, it's a really, it's a really, it's a tough problem. It's one of the reasons why we know so little about the movements of even the largest fish in the ocean, basically. We have time for maybe one more question. Katai, I saw your hand up. Um, okay, first of all, that was a great presentation, thank you so much, but um, I was curious about how you select critical habitats for these large pelagics. They're really, they're highly migratory and they're not going to be staying in one place, and this is something that we discussed with Sargassum, but 
Um, are there areas that are more critical than others, and how do you identify those areas? Yeah, so I think that's kind of really where the rubber hits the road, right? If you're making protected areas, it doesn't matter how big they are, if you're not actually lessening the fishing, the fishing mortality on that population, then you're not actually doing any good, right? So if they're moving through those protected areas sufficiently quickly and they're actually become, the fleet becomes you know, more accessible, they become more accessible to fleets um, outside, then you're not actually doing any good. So, so I think the, um, so, so the first question is, is, can you design protected areas that will lessen fisheries, more, you know, fishing mortality on populations? And if you can do that, then I think you're already in a win situation, right? And then if you can't, you know, is there some way of doing, you know, um, sort of moving protected areas, sort of following migration pathways? Um, and I think that's, you know, these days, fishermen know exactly where they are at any time, right? There's the fact that, you know, we can move protected boxes, right? And the fishermen have got no reason for not being able to comply. So, you know, that would be another way. Right? So I think the critical habitat with something like this um, is difficult. Um, critical corridors, you know, um, might be much more feasible. Um, and to do that, we're going to have to get a better idea. We're going to have to get better positions. Plus or minus 100 miles is simply not going to cut it if we realistically want to be um, protected corridors that these fish might move through. Um, you can imagine, for instance, with the swords, that there is a bunch of seamounts, and they, they may actually be using those seamounts as a corridor. But until we actually get the data to show that, it's difficult to make any decision. So, um, yeah, it is hard, especially with these very, you know, very mobile species um, to do that. And it's a, it's a numbers game. You know, I think we've got five white sharks and spot tags on in the northwest Atlantic, right? That's really hard to come up with probability density points for habitat use based on, you know, five sharks. Thank you so much. Yeah.